blocks are one of the most elemental toys of early childhood. They're also really humble seeming, but also one of the most versatile. I've invited Carla Horowitz to join us today on Lauren's Learning Lab to talk about why that is. Carla is on the faculty at Yale University in the Education Studies Program, the Child Studies Center, and the Department of Psychology. I started by asking her, why do we see wood unit blocks in early childhood centers so often, and how can we bring them into our own homes? Well, children have been playing with pieces of wood forever. The blocks are just a very wonderful, organized way of providing materials for children to play with where they can envision their world, they can recreate it, and they can actually uh, think. Um, and the thinking happens um, not with a pencil, but with their whole bodies and their senses, their brains and their fingers. And so blocks really enable children to symbolically represent their world in a very immediate way and blocks have a way of falling down and so things have to be recreated uh, as many things do in this world and it just opens up avenues of creativity and imagination and problem solving and critical thinking and negotiation and all of the things we want our children to learn are embedded in unit blocks. I happen to really love the quality of the material, just the fact that my kids, you know, the, the blocks themselves are wood, they're natural color, there's no paint applied to the blocks we have. And unlike many other toys, blocks are just, they're very neutral. And in their neutrality, they can kind of become anything. And, you know, for me, I, I love how open that leaves their play and interaction. Well, I think that you've, you've really hit the nail on the head because open-ended materials help to create open-ended play and open-ended thinking. Whereas blocks do all kinds of things, mm -hmm. they happen to uh, lend themselves to a lot of play that um, is possible because of the, the, the divisions being exact, the way they're made, and the proportions they're in one to two to four ratio, which means they're half as high as they are wide, and they're two times as long as wide. It enables children to really kinesthetically absorb the mathematical relationships and the geometrical relationships between these materials. And so they get very good at figuring out if they run out of that size block, well, I could use two of those mm -hmm. to make the same size and it'll fit right in here. They have a heft, they have a weight, they just are a very satisfying material to use. And I think it connects children in, in a way to the natural world and to their own place in it. In addition to being on the faculty at Yale University, Carla was also the director of Yale University's Calvin Hill Daycare Center and Kitty Lessman Finling Kindergarten for 40 years. I asked Carla to talk a little bit about the underlying philosophy at Kelvin Hill, especially as it relates to block play. Well, I think um, the basic premises of the Kelvin Hill philosophy and mission are um, trust and respect for children and their learning. Really a wish to provide for children a way to create and to imagine and to learn. So blocks are central, you're right. We, have a, we do have a very large block area in each of the three age programs that we have. We really believe that blocks are central to the curriculum. So children use them every day. They're set up on low shelves. They're very well organized on purpose because children need to be able to go to the shelf and get the shape that they need. It's really pretty much linear building and linear storage. And actually, um, we want children very much engaged, not only in the building, but in the cleanup. Because the cleanup is a, an organizational um, tool for sorting 
and classifying as well as being for being a good member of the classroom community so that you know you take care of the materials and when you're done using them you actually put them back and when they're organized on a, on a shelf in a meaningful way they allow children to be really drivers of their own ideas and imagination and also of helping to organize them when in rather than just a big mess i've been in classrooms where all the blocks are stored in a great big box mm -hmm. you could never find the shape that you really need without throwing out all the you know blocks as you're looking right. that is not constructive block building we want the blocks to be available so the children can operationalize their ideas not keep searching or looking or you know not have the material ready to hand I love the idea of kinesthetic learning, right? Hands-on learning and internalizing complex mathematic principles through just intuitive an intuitive understanding of physical relationships. Um, I see that in my three-year-old where she loves working with unit blocks and she has to problem solve. And she's always very satisfied when she finds the matches that equal something else. And she says, this is perfect, mommy. <laughs> That's her way of saying this, this works, I could stack this. It measures what this other block measures. And brains develop and they're exposed to other material or other experiences. Do you see that too? That kids begin to model their worlds in different ways with blocks? Yes, I, um, developmentally, um, children are, they're very concrete, but they move from the random to the planned and from you know just any old thing to real symbolic work the youngest children very often um carry the blocks around or you know the threes or under they have a much smaller set because they get overwhelmed with mm -hmm. too many blocks they actually will pretty much just make enclosures they might stack them or pile them they might make a bridge but it's pretty random construction. It's not intentional. They're really experimenting with the material. But then they can really begin to use blocks in a more intentional way. And the older the children are, the more they do that. So you would have children who would build something with perhaps more blocks, and then they'd name it. Oh, that's a garage. Then there are children who are really very, the older children, the fours, the fives, they're vi especially if they've had experience with blocks before, they are very intentional. I'm going to make an airport. This is a farm, this is a zoo, this is a jail. So they, they set out with an idea and then they try and make that happen so that they're working symbolically with the blocks to create a structure that has a meaning that they've already decided on. And in addition, they may uh, want to do some labeling. So, you know, we get into the sort of language, reading and writing literacy part of it. Um, so they, you know, they're incorporating what they know about the world and recreating it symbolically. And that is, the symbolic process is the most fundamental part of learning. So, you know, the fact that when they learn how to read, they have to develop, they have to internalize and, and understand a whole symbol system uh, with very abstract letters. Mm -hmm. um, sounds and symbols have to be put together in a particular way. Well, the blocks enable them to create a symbol that is in their head that they can make and produce. And so for the older children, certainly the fives and up to the age of your kids, um, your, your boys, um, they then set out to build some really pretty, uh, incredible things. They make marble tracks. So they're doing all kinds of inclined planes and physics. Mm -hmm. They wanna see how far they can get that marble to go. They know that they need to adjust the angle if they want the, the marble to go faster, nobody's taught them any of the, the you know, the, the theorems or the, or the theory of uh, physics, but they are doing it with the blocks and they have, as you said, a kind of an intuitive understanding about how this will have to work and having things fail and trying again and rethinking it because there must be a better way um, all of that contributes to the kind of, of 
thinking and learning that happens you know, throughout life and especially in school. While the focus of this episode has been mostly on block play, I hope you can see that these ideas are really fundamental to many aspects of how children work and play. I hope you'll join me in part two of this segment where Carla and I continue the conversation about children's work and play and how we can support it as adults. As always, we'll include links to helpful information and relevant articles and resources in the video description. I'll see you next time. Take care.